the vast majority of the reason why agencies lose their clients isn't usually because of results unless you're a terrible agency you usually lose clients because either you've not set expectations properly or they've not managed uh, set expectations properly you kind of gave a couple of areas that look really interesting do you want to, do you want to talk mm. to us about some of those big kind of mistakes that agencies make consistently and how they can perhaps resolve those so if you consider trying to do the right positioning and messaging your your marketing will fail if your if your website headline says something hyperbolic like we do everything for everyone buy it all right now here because you can't maintain like consistency so is the agency model broken then i, I quite i read a lot about this kind of you know, the traditional agency model um the model's not broken what you just said is broken about the model leadership is a huge amount more um uh, personal ownership and accountability Leadership is, uh, is um, uh, there's a lot more consistency required. You need to, um, you need to really um, know who you are before you can lead. Welcome to Socially Unacceptable, from f***ups to fame, the marketing podcast that celebrates the professional mishaps, mistakes and misjudgments while delivering valuable marketing and life lessons in the time it takes you to eat your lunch. Hey, thanks everybody. Welcome to the show. Um, today, you're, we're lucky to be in, uh, have on the line Chris Simmons. Um, he is the founder of OMG Centre, which aims to accelerate the growth of digital agencies through consultancy, mentorship, training and support. He's also worked in several digital marketing agencies, working mainly in SEO and digital strategy. And then as chairman at Oct Octus Digital, he built up the search-based digital agency to offices in London and Manchester. So, How's that for an introduction, Chris? Have I got that right? I mean, you've condensed, I think, about 12 years into about 45 seconds, so that feels about right. <laughs> okay, good. Thanks Thanks for coming along. Uh, thanks for joining us. I mean, Thank you. We, we've followed... It's nice to be on the other side of the microphone. Exactly, yeah. So, I mean, what I've had missed off there is that you... Um, I've put here that you speak at events across the world. Um, you, you look at how digital agencies tick. Um, you look, and you also run the popular podcast, which is interesting, which is the digital digital agency podcast. And we have an office dog. Is that right? Indeed. Which is yep, it's right behind me there. Yeah, <laughs> I, I saw that bit. And plug. I just, that's a that's a good plug. So, what have you, what have, uh, what advice can you give us for a podcast, then, Chris? I'm I'm, I'm intrigued. Um, all success in every fashion comes from consistency. So get it done. Keep going. Um, most most of the time, uh, no one knows when you've made a mistake, so just keep going with it. That's that's reassuring to hear. <laughs> we just we just tend to miss ourselves when we make a mistake, um, because the show is the show is about mistakes. We've been told not to swear in the first two minutes, according to you, the YouTube uh, situation. Anyway, right. So, <laughs> oh really? Okay. So why do I mean I'm fascinated to hear your story. I mean, you said I've, I've packed it into 45 seconds there, but actually it's it's deliberate because I'd like to hear. A little bit about your background um so do you want to just walk us through your career and and how you've got to where you are today and what you know what you do today yeah um okay yeah sure um so um speaking of background in the background you'll see uh, several snowboards and several skateboards long boards electric boards i like board sports um over the course of uh a 10 year period i lived over in ski resorts um in chalets and repping and ski guiding and things like that um eventually when i physically couldn't do that anymore because you know the knees go and other health matters i had to come back to the uk and um whilst i was convalescing i uh i had to find a job and i had no qualifications no uh experience professionally beyond customer service type stuff uh, so I got a job in a travel agent trying to sell holidays. That didn't work out very well because it was a high street travel agent. Right. And who's going into high street travel agencies apart from, you know, older people and things like that. So, you know, planes were in the sky, holidays were moving, things were happening. And I thought, well, the Internet must be where it's all going on. So I taught myself SEO, found an agency crazy enough to take me on. Um, and within uh, a year and a half or so, I'd moved up to London and uh, and then packed agency uh employment in to build my own after um, a year and a half yeah so you you worked for an agency for a year and a half and you went i can do this better than that yeah that's it so how, how old were you at this point uh 20 uh 12 years ago so 24 
four, I think, if that my maths is I right. I mean, that, that's some confidence, that, to be in a job for a year and a half. Yeah, yeah I'm not what? sure on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure on confidence, I'm afraid. Okay, good. Well, that's good. All right, and then what happened? Um, yeah, so so ran the agency for um, uh, for nearly nine-ish plus years. About um, four years before we wound it down, we I started up a web development business at the same time, and they ran concurrently. So I was running two agencies at the exact same uh, exact same time, which is stupid. Um, and I learned that um, through you know a lot of uh, tired and sleepless nights. But um, the reason they were separated was because the web development business was building websites which digital agencies clients would want. So yeah. we were selling websites to other agencies um and uh when i was doing that i was realizing actually to be perfectly honest there's quite a good uh there's quite a good industry here i'm i was in my own little own agency island for quite a while and didn't realize that lots of the things i hear on uh on the uh over the negotiation table were pretty much the same problems i have um and just realize that you know there's um there's a lot of um there's a lot to to learn um, running an agency, there's a lot of mistakes that can get made, and an awful lot of those mistakes cost people money. So um, I, uh, I exited the web development business, uh, wound the uh, um, digital agency into a consultancy, and then started helping other agency owners build their business instead because it's way more fun. <laughs> a lot better at it, I think. So um, you must have a fascinating inside track on. Um on the challenges agencies face, the, the big mistakes they make. Um, in the kind of the pre-show briefing, you, you kind of gave a couple of areas that look really interesting. Do you want to, do you want to talk mm. to us about some of those big kind of mistakes that agencies make consistently and how they can perhaps resolve those? Yeah. Um, which one do you want to talk about first in particular? Because I could, I mean, I, I talk to people about this all week long, every week. So I could, this podcast could be hours, quite long. Hours long. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, the one that grabbed me really was uh, multi service agencies offering everything to everyone. And I think that's, you know, when you're a full service yeah. agency, that's, that's a tendency, isn't it? Let's just sell a lot of stuff to a lot of people. Let's try and do everything. Is, yeah. is that the wrong approach? Um, it can be. Yeah. Um, so if you consider trying to, do the right positioning and messaging your your marketing will fail if your if your website headline says something hyperbolic like we do everything for everyone buy it all right now here because you can't maintain like consistency you can't uh, you, it's it's really hard to sell seo ppc email cro and content marketing and digital pr to a fashion brand and to an e-commerce company and to a travel brand and get it consistent so at some point, the balance tips to it either costs you too much to deliver a consistent service and not churn clients, or it costs too much to bring in clients because you have to go heavy on different types of marketing. So usually you work out in the if you get the positioning right, you're talking to the right people at the right time in the right way, you're only saying the same thing that resonates with them better. So you can deliver all of those services, but to an individual niche, or you can deliver one service to many people but your then your messaging is very much more clear with the seo agency for everyone but we only do seo uh, or we're the full service marketing agency for travel brands it means that all of your messaging all your marketing your case studies everything lines up with that you can be experts in one or the other fashion the problem is that most agencies and i did this and quite a lot of agencies do this is you start out and cash flow is the killer you need cash so you say yes to everything you take everything on you uh you make the error of essentially taking things on potentially too low value someone says hey you're doing the seo and the ppc do you reckon you can do the email and you go i've used mailchimp once of course yeah absolutely then you have an email marketing service that you suddenly spin up and it then becomes untenable eventually because more and more clients will want other things and you then don't have experts in the in the single subject matter you've got people yep. doing everything everywhere and when one of them goes you then how are you going to replace that and I, thing I it's just that, too many different I learned that lesson right at the beginning even before Will joined joined me here at prohibition when I started out I people were like oh you you do blogs you do because it was right at the time right at the beginning of social media before, before anyone knew how to use it really and um I was meeting people and they were asking me to build websites and I was going, oh yep. yeah, we can do that. I'll do that in WordPress, started doing it. And then before I got maybe four websites in and thought, this is not for me. I do not yep. enjoy doing this. This isn't where You've my skills are. It's got to be a massively high 
sort of uh, level of masochism to want to be a web developer because I've I have yeah. never in the, even running an agency for that built them for agencies you'd think that we'd get briefing properly and we get project management properly it just is so, there's far too many interconnected random bits and then you add a bit of flavor of creativity and it all falls down yeah I don't think you can it's just it's a horrible horrible business if you're running a web dev business and you're listening to this why <laughs> So um, this idea of kind of niching, um, niching the agency and really kind of focusing on what you want to do, what you're good at, where you can mm. have the most value. How, you know, for, for agencies or consultants, you know, starting that journey of building an agency, how, how soon should they do that? It, it, do you need to stick to your guns and really think, OK, what, what do I want to do? What sectors do I have a great knowledge in? Yeah, so there's there's a couple of things to do. First of all, if you're really, really good and you've got a really good base, like a good base of um, in your network, then it might be easier to niche early doors because you know that those people know you're good at one thing. And then when you kind of put the sign up and says, hey, I'm in business, people will come uh, from that that perspective and you'll have plenty of work in. Um, for the most part, the the best thing to do is kind of look at what you love doing, then what you're really good at doing that you love doing, and then what you're really good at doing that you love doing that you can also make a, a decent amount decent amount of cash out of and then you decide is that a skill or is that a uh, an experience based thing so if it's an experience based thing it might well be travel and therefore you match the skills to the to the area if it's a experience a skill based thing you then say okay it's just search or it's just paid cuz i i enjoy social media i'm really good at paid ads on social media I therefore should be doing social media paid ads only. So uh, you've done 60 podcasts. I mean, this is episode, I think this is episode six or seven. And I need to track of when the next one's coming out for us. So you've done, you spoke to at least 60 uh, founders of um, business owners and you do, you do, you speak to people every day. What's the common, what are the common biggest mistakes that you're seeing in, in running agencies? Um, so most agency leaders start agencies because they're really good at the thing that they're delivering. They do what I did. They go, I'm a bit better than the person that's employing me right now, so I'm going to go do it for myself. They very quickly then end up accidentally getting into the exact same service model delivery that they left, and they just have their logo and the nice documents instead. So um, the, the majority of agency leaders are great at the delivery of the thing. It's the running of the business that is often the problem and they are businesses yeah. like they're great fun. You can be really creative. You can have your bean bag and you can have all your cool stuff, but you've got to run them like businesses. And the only way to do that is to really understand the numbers. Like what is the net profit margin on an individual client? No one in almost no one I ever speak to knows that specifically, but you should have a scorecard, a, score, sorry, a, a cost calculator for every single client. You should know what your OPEX is. The second you increase in a new member of staff, you should know immediately how many more X's and Y's you need when you bring in another member of staff or another client. What does the API credit mean uh, if you then need to, to call on that for four more clients? Well, it's usually 50 quid a client, but it's not going to be if you bring in one that's a 10 million page website and it's got loads of stuff going on. So you've got to like you've got to know your numbers and understand the the impact of that. And the majority of the time, not knowing your numbers means you make decisions that then impact something later down the line. You get in this hamster wheel of get client, lose client, find staff, lose staff, get client, lose client, find staff, lose staff, burn out, stop, do it all again, reinvent yourself, and start again. And it doesn't actually um, it doesn't actually change anything unless you kind of know where you're going and what the numbers are. That's an interesting point. Yeah. And I think a lot of I think probably growing agencies, you can get to a certain point without really needing to have too much of a handle on that, can't you? But then every agency hits that tipping point where suddenly it becomes a bigger, fully functioning business where there's you know, a big payroll. There's there's numbers to hit each month. And I think a lot of agencies probably, you know, like like you say, they have plenty of training in the technical side of things. But actually, guess what? HR, finance, um, running a business, they, they just learn on the job which is is the wrong, the wrong way to look yeah. at it so is the agency model broken then i, I quite I, I read a lot about this kind of you know the traditional agency model um you know you know a lot of agencies will invest you know 60 percent of their time winning new businesses 
um, mm. sorry, winning new business, clients drop out the bottom and they're stuck in this cycle of pitching for business, winning new business, yeah. losing business. And uh, yeah, is, is that is that the wrong model? Um, the model's not broken. What you just said is broken about the model. Um, so the the there's there's far too many different sort of niche elements to this, but m the majority of agencies, um, if they focus on better client retention, then any new clients coming in on top increases their profit margins. If they're focused on client retention, but they don't work on their marketing, then they just have stagnation. Um, the uh, the uh, there's a, a you know four post um, uh, um, balance it's like one of those seesaws that you've got four or five sides to it, you can't if you focus on one thing another thing isn't going to um, work out that well yeah. so running them like a business you should have these things in a, def a kind of equitable balance yeah. if I'm um, if I'm looking at um, clients dropping out the bottom that client costs money to to bring in it costs money to to maintain you might have made a profit on it that was a, a relatively decent profit, but it didn't impact your cash flow very well because you've now got to replace that client when they drop out. That means the cost of delivering a new client in increases with every new client. That means eventually you're eroding a, uh, your your cash flow and your and your overall margins, and you've just got loads of cash coming in the bank, and you think you're great and you think you're rock stars, but you're not. Um, you've got to get you, you you've got to realize that. A five percent increase in uh, decrease in client churn is is actually probably more valuable to you than than sticking I don't know ten grand on awards. You, you said at the beginning that you learned you learned to do, become a mentor and a, a coach. Is it is it is it business coaching that you'd say that, that you do? So I, I like to call it um, agency advisory because coaching implies that you've got something to fix or there's a problem. Yep. The advisory aspect comes when people what? are asking for help and ready to go. I'm not so yeah. sure it does. I mean, like co coaching for me, um, well, when you know, we've been going 12 years. And so co coaching for me, I'm massively into coaching. I've, uh, I had a coach before Will joined the business. I had a coach when I started out and I've had a coach pretty much every other year of the last 12 yeah. years because you don't know what you don't know and a coach mm -hmm. isn't there to tell give you all the answers they're there to coach you into the scenarios and get you to improve how you how you operate basically and each and, and what you've just talked about there like the the agency model people i remember meeting i was in a pitch years ago and this guy said to me your 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 agency model is it's outdated it's all going to change everyone's going to outsource so and and that hasn't happened that was 6 7 years ago yeah. and then consequently they went out of business and agencies are still the, the same way that they, you know they're, they're, other than the technology yeah. that's changing the software ai and all that stuff that's coming out I, I still believe um, the agency model, like you say, is right. But I do believe in coaching. So you said that mm. you learn from you've learned um, from your mistakes. This show is mm -hmm. all about. I can swear now. Fuck ups. This show is all about <laughs> fuck ups. So come on then, give us your fuck ups. What fuck ups have you made that you've learned and you pull into your mentorship and your agency advisory role? So um, from a, a leadership and management perspective, I I let uh, I let the the emotional aspect of the business impact the way I worked with the team. So client left, I took an emotional, personal feeling behind that rather than how how can we make this not happen again, which then made me a pretty bad manager slash leader. Um, and I think that, you know, as a big mistake was pro probably anyone listening to this that, that worked with me uh, when I ran one of the agencies will probably go be nodding right now and going, yeah, that guy's a dick. Um, <laughs> and they never not think that I'm a dick because at they some point, if I they think you're a dick, will they? <laughs> I probably, well, I probably just, yeah, maybe they, yeah, they'll just be yeah, <laughs> um, burning those effigies somewhere still. Um, but it, you know, sometimes you realise that it's your business, it's your baby. Um, all the all the wins are someone else's, all the losses are yours, uh, and sometimes you get a punch in the face, and uh, metaphorically, um, a client leaves or something happens, something goes wrong. And you shouldn't, but you do take it out on someone else. And that was that that I learned the hard way because I realized introspectively later I shouldn't have done that. And you can't apologize for that later. It doesn't work just by mm. saying sorry. Mm. Um the the other stuff was genuinely I I did not have a proper handle on the numbers. I thought I did, I had management accounts, had all that sort of stuff, but cash flow was what was coming in, and I thought we were doing great. And then when 
a, one or two clients left in in the same period of time just as you've hired one or two members yeah. of staff yeah. in the same period of time you suddenly realize ah crap where's the vat bill coming from mm. um and you haven't really provisioned for it properly that, that that's that, i mean the there are a lot of agencies that are probably thinking right now as they're listening to this that oh, yeah i'm doing that right now crap okay and that's what happens a lot because they just you i i i i, I I thought I got it. I thought I had a handle on it. I didn't. And when I did eventually get a handle on it, I kind of realized that I've learned, like I've learned something significant here and this isn't worth kind of just sitting in, in one box, hence starting the second agency. Yeah. And I own a few other businesses outside of the digital industry. And all of that's come from learning these things that I've just kind of, uh, I say happened upon, but been open to, to learning as I go. That's interesting about cash flow. I mean, things like that, it, it, it seems so obvious, doesn't it? But it's, it's not, you know, and when you're in the trenches, when, you know, and agencies are busy and hectic, aren't they? You know, it's very long hours. Yeah. It's very often demanding clients. That that stuff isn't always obvious, is it? When, 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 no, when you're no, in that situation. No, no, and like what he says there, like you've got, if you're That's... winning clients, you, you know, you might have 30, 40 clients and you're winning stuff regularly and you maybe you lose a couple, you're winning, you hire somebody to help you facilitate that client and then you lose a couple and then you don't realize what you've lost and you it can easily be done it sounds obvious when you talk when you take a step back the the helicopter view i think but um yeah. if you're in the trenches like will says and you do, you're just getting on with the day to day running the business you know somebody's off poorly or you know you've all the different scenarios and hats you have to wear as running running a company yeah. um and before you know it you're 3 months in and you've got the vat bill like you say and i think when you're well, in that, yeah, well, you, you sorry go on sorry yeah i was going to say when i was going to say you might we're going to clip that bit yeah we'll clip that out i'll start again um yeah i think when you're in that growth phase of an agency often the problems can just be papered over can't they you know and you, you don't necessarily yeah. spot those but it's only when you plateau you lose a client that all these things suddenly become obvious and, and the wheels start to fall off yeah you, you you take on let's say let's say for argument's sake in um we're recording this at the end of july so beginning of august you bring in two new clients they're significant size They've got 90 day payment terms because of their, you know, how their finance works. You've agreed to that. You've got 90 plus days before you see the first penny from those clients. But during July, you lost two semi decent clients that paid on 30 days terms. You've got a huge hole um, in the cash flow. And if more, if loads of money's coming in that kind of papers over it, so to speak, and your PL doesn't reflect that, your cash flow does. And you start looking at your bank balance and the yeah. bank balance bank balance is if you're doing it properly go down ever so slightly and you start going oh okay we've got all this the PL says good everything looks good but actually there's cash in the bank which is going down here and we should have at least three bit three three and a bit months of cash in the bank here and we don't now what's happened and you then diagnose it um later Are you are giving me anxiety oh, no, that that no. bad payers <laughs> Right, running an agency, like we want to work with great clients. We work with some great clients. We've actually turned down pitches we've won because um, some yeah. clients have been on uh, more than 90 days payment. Like 90 days to pay your agency that are working for you. You know, we've got 30 staff working hard at yeah. it. We've got to pay all their salaries, like you say, and you've got to wait 90 days just to get your bill paid. And then if they pay late, yeah. it just isn't, yeah. that's not a great client to have, is it? No, that's right. I mean, what, why people can't pay on time, I don't know, but that's uh, every, I think every industry suffers from that, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, so it's 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 um, business wide, should we say? Um, but like one of the things we put in our lead scoring was, um, and it, there's no point in going through the whole pitching process to then get to the end and kind mm. of see a massive red flag. And you can mitigate that and sort of say, have they given us a brief? Yes, ten points. Are they in an industry we like? No, minus five points. Do they have payment terms of 30 days um, or less? Yes, plus 10 points. And if it's 90 days, you go, it's, it's a massive red one straight away and you speak to someone that might want it instead. I should, but it's, it's all down to like the brand because like, you know, oh, Samsung would like you to p pitch for this. Oh, sorry, Samsung. Yeah. And it's always the big, great blue chip clients that, okay, great, yeah, we'd love to work with you. Uh, and then you obviously wouldn't, <laughs> the first question, so um, about your uh, tender, we'd just like to ask you, what are your payment terms? And they go 120 days and you're like, oh, oh we'll, we'll do it anyway because it's some, do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, that's actually, let's, yeah. let's dig into that. That's really interesting. So those, you know, I think pitching is hugely expensive and hugely time consuming. So what are those red flags? 
agencies should look out for, you know, because it's quite a bold move, isn't it? Rejecting a, a major brand in a pitch, um, you know, it can be dis, yeah. dis, 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 demotivating for the team. So what what should we look out for? I, 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 well, I think it comes down to the early doors lead scoring that you do internally. So you get that request for proposal, request for information from them, and you read that intently and you look at that against your typical lead scoring process. So is the brief full? Do you have scoring? Do they have scoring for how they how they choose? How many people are they? Uh, how many people are you pitching against, etc.? And then if there are any, if there's a, if there's not a, um, uh, you know, at the end of the the RFP or the RFQ, there's usually a um, the the dates that stuff will happen. One of the first sets of dates should be like there's an open week to ask a single set of series of questions. So in those questions, any questions you don't have answered in the in the RFP. That's that's when you should be saying what are the payment terms, what uh, what are the the layers of sign off because it's not written in there. That should make a big impact because if it is 120 days and you don't want to wait 120 days to get paid because it's going to be a two month proposal period and it's going to take a lot of effort and it's going to take the team out of things. That's that's opportunity cost as well. You you should be looking at what's the cost of delivering this proposal to the business and it's going to be four people over the course of three weeks, which is going to account for about £6,000 to maybe be scored against another agency or three on fair scoring metrics, but then I have to wait 120 days for the money. Um, like I, With my external hat on, looking into agencies, my advice would always be, be honest, be polite, because it's the, the world is relatively small nowadays, and say, look, I'd love to pitch, love to do this, but the terms of this don't don't suit my business. So thanks very much. I can recommend someone to speak to if you'd like. Inside the agency years ago, I would have probably been pig-headed enough to take it on. Do, do, you know, you just mentioned there, like, pig-headed as a, not for you personally, but you know, like you just said, what, what I've, what, I mean, Will and I run, run, run an agency. I've met a few, we know, I've got a few friends that run agencies, but I don't know million. I know I see them on Twitter. I'm friends with a lot on Twitter, but not, don't sit down and chew the fat with them about what is the, is the commonalities yeah. between agency owners that you see, like in the personalities and the character of, of how they, are, are we quite all pig headed to use your term? Yeah. I mean, for the, for the most part, we're, um, there's a there's a um, competitive aspect to the personality that you need to have in order to do a business like this, and you also um, like I, I mean if you forget agency people and you just think digital marketing people in 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 more generality, um, there's a um, in, and this is not uh, meant in a nasty way. There's an arrogance that we all kind of carry. We've we've done some cool stuff. We've seen these results come in. We feel pretty bloody good. Then you go to conferences or you go to events and you speak to people and you say, hey, what do you do? Oh, I run an agency. What's the first question that someone asks you when you mention that you run an agency? That's God. a good question. What, a... what clients have you got? How big is the agency? Yeah. Well, how, how many how, people? How many people are you? Yeah, exactly. First question. And then what's what sector are you working? Yeah. There's an assumption that pe number of staff equals some prestige. Everyone's measuring um, each other up, aren't they? And going yeah. back to your numbers mm -hmm. thing, the prestige and staff thing, right? So I was re recently on a some sort of workshop, and I thought this was quite interesting because the, the guy that was running the workshop said, roughly, um, to figure out your revenue per head, whatever business you're in, it's usually about 100,000 per head. And I was like... That can't be right. That's too simple. And he said it is a bit simplistic. But and then I went, okay, hundred thousand per head. And I went on the we we're, we're in the PR sector, so I went on PR Week's top one hundred and fifty, and you can see PR revenue per head, and it was between yeah. eighty five and one hundred and fifty thousand. So I was like, that that is about right for for our sector. Yeah. I don't know we, what what about for your sector. And um, I'm, I mean, for me in in particular, I mean, I'm, I, I, all my, all my uh, agency advisors are, are um, consultants for us, so I don't know what they charge, what they pay, <laughs> and what they get paid. Um, but we used to, when when I started the agency, the original agency back in 2014, we worked on a rule of seven, so it was about seven grand a head per person, which then roughly was about eighty, ninety ish over the course of an entire year. Yeah. So it's probably about the same as yeah. it was as a as a benchmark back then, actually. So it does, it does kind of work, doesn't it, as a simplistic way to figure? Yeah. 
just so the, the, the thing Sorry. the thing that I think we often we often mistake is um uh, scale slash growth slash all this hustle nonsense that everyone talks about all the time and um your business is as good as you measure it and as good as the bank balance can measure it so you know if you look at the if you look at what you want from the business and it is a hundred person team you need to make sure that you can afford to live um well enough and healthy enough to have a hundred person team yeah and therefore you have there are numbers you need to make in order to do that if you want um to take a hundred thousand two hundred thousand pounds a month a, a year of profit out of the business clear profit for yourselves you either need x revenue or y net profit from the business mm. and that's the measure of success um so i often tell the 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 agency leaders that i work with and quite a lot of the advisors that work with me often do as well is your success and your scale and your value and your bravado in your agency should be measured on where where you are against where you want to be going okay um will had a question there yeah sorry well what's sorry go on um just circling back to the um the new yeah. business conversation the, the pitching for new business um, a couple of kind of red flags we personally have, um, number of agencies yeah. being invited to pitch and time frames. You know, sometimes great brand, but you get quite an unrealistic time frame. You know, sometimes it's a week, isn't it? And, yeah. And, and it's clear you're, you're a bit of an afterthought or, or there's mis, yeah. you know, misorganization their side. Is, is there any kind of hard and fast? You know, at what point would you refuse a brief, um, you know, with the number of agencies being invited to pitch? Do you think? We, we, we pitched for a hol We were about to pitch for a holiday brand famous holiday brand, mm. which we shall rename nameless. Um, and they told us that we were one of 12. And we said, no, thank you. Goodbye. Which and is astonishing that a marketing director would have the time to uh, to consult 12 agencies. So. And they were shocked that we'd turn them down because they're a big, 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 well-known brand. And, but we're just like, we're not, we don't, we're not, that's just a waste of time. Yeah. Yeah. And so general rule of thumb gut level uh, red flag for me was you scan to the bottom and you see what the the the, the um, if there are fee expectations. So if they don't say how much they're looking for um, as fees, then the chances are they're buying on price and it doesn't really matter how good your pitch is. So probably walk away um, because it's a race to the bottom, essentially. Um, and bear in mind, I'm saying all this with the, with the 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 comfort of sitting on the other side of the fence as I give this advice. So you need to take all this with as much pinch of salt as you as you can. Um, the the other thing is, if you do have fees in there, scan through and see how many pages this this RFP is. And if it's like twenty or thirty pages, and the fee doesn't feel right based on the fact that you've not even read those twenty or thirty pages, maybe their expectations are too high, and the vast majority of the reason why agencies lose their clients isn't usually because of results. Unless you're a terrible agency, you usually lose clients because either you've not set expectations properly or they've not managed uh, set expectations properly. And the, and, and it's ultimately because we're people and we kind of assume that someone thinks the same way or whatever yeah. else. But if their expectations are 30 page RFP and the fees seem decent, but yeah. not, like decent enough to be able to middle of expectation. How are you going to condense a 30 page RFP into a one hour um, presentation deck kind of thing? You know, there's, there's a mismatch immediately. Expectations is you're right. It, that is exactly why agencies or you would fire a supplier because at the end of the day, you, you're not, we're not going to be bad at your job, but if their expectations yeah. are set too high, you, you, you're right. And, and it's all down to the pitch as well. Cause some people to win a pitch will promise the earth. And we try to not do yeah. do that. Um, you have to try to not do that because if you do that at the pitch, you start on the back foot, which is always a nightmare. And that idea that it's you know I think yeah. there's the I think a lot of agencies there's, there's the tendency to go in cheap, you know, win it on price, and that's great for three months, isn't it? Before um, the the bitterness sets in and you realise you're making no money from it, <laughs> and then you, you can then no longer put the price up until the three the, month bitterness. <laughs> We, we, we don't get yeah, that. And, we, we don't, we don't get that. We, we don't get that. We're, we're delightful people. <laughs> and, and, um, and the, well, the, 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 the three month bitterness sets in just around the time that sadly another client leaves or you have to pay a recruiter 20% fees oh, or, yeah. to replace a member of staff that left because of internal expectation management as well. 
Um, I don't know if we did. We did we get your biggest fuck up? We got you didn't. This is the VAT, but we never got to the b- bottom of your biggest your biggest professional fuck up. We need to get that into the show. Too emotional, I think it was. You too emotional. I, it was, uh, I I I uh, I I, I uh, take too much mental ownership of stuff, and then therefore it feels bad when something goes wrong. So. Um, emotionally dealing with things is 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 probably the biggest fuck up because I think there were some great people who worked with me years ago and and I am ninety percent certain that the, almost all of them desperately dislike me <laughs> and that's why so so uh, it did, was a fuck up because I did it wrong and, I shouldn't have been that person and how did this what what are we talking here shouting and screaming kicking things over um. Ju- <laughs> no, uh, I think uh, I'm far too passive aggressive, and uh, and uh, I'm very good with my words. Should we say? Um, wasn't swearing, all that sort of stuff, but I just wasn't very nice at talking to people, um, and it's not a nice way to to treat people who choose to work with you. No, and, and they won't stay with. And like, this is the thing. I worked for somebody a, a long time ago um, before I set up, and um, I saw him. I came into a uh, a meeting, and he was briefing his graphics team. And he shouting and screaming at somebody who'd who'd fucked up a um, design, one of the yeah. designers. And he kicked all these leaflets over. Do you remember the good old days of leaflets? We used to design and brand. Th- uh, he, k- he kicked all the leaflets over and effing and jeffing. And I just thought, I never want to behave like this. It, it, it was shocking behaviour. Yeah. And to see people that yeah. it doesn't get the best out of people if they live in fear, does it? It it doesn't. And I and I I've read a lot and I've learned a lot since. And I've realised that. Um, there's a there's a um, a quote and I'm not going to remember who it's from, um, but it's uh, never attribute mal- uh, to malice that that could be attributed to ignorance, and usually that ignorance is because you haven't briefed someone properly or you haven't given them the training they need or you haven't given them the time that they need to deliver it properly. Um, it's very rarely is it the person um, being maliciously n- uh, negligent in any way. Mm. Um, well, I've, I was going to ask about. Uh, if you don't mind, well, what, what, so, um, you know, um, what's your top hack for growth then? Uh, n- n- know where you're going, like have a plan. Um, I know it sounds really, it sounds very arbitrary, but if you know where you're going, like let's say you have a three year vision for in three years, we're going to be in this place. That's something you can articulate to your team. That's something you can create messaging around. That's something which you can create OKRs around. That's something that people will work towards. It's also something that helps you. If you've got a long long horizon, a long view, when something doesn't go to plan, you know whether or not it's going to impact that vision and you can keep the people on track. Mm-hmm. Um, the, 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 there's a... Um, there's there's essentially four stages in running in, in making changes in a business. You've got the the forming, the storming, the norming, then the performing stage. And at the forming stage, you've come up with your vision and you come up with your idea and you tell everyone how cool it is and everyone's like, yeah, this is great and we're going to do this cool stuff. Then you get into the storming stage and that's where everything's changing a little bit and people forget who they are and what they're doing and things go wrong and people shout and it doesn't feel very nice. And usually most agencies will go straight back to the the forming bit because it doesn't feel very nice, it doesn't feel very comfortable. Mm. And they'll have spent a load of money, time and effort and lost a few clients and lost a few things rather than kind of um, sit in that discomfort and work out how to get it right and how to tweak it a little bit before you then get into this norming stage where things are running well mm. and things are running in an even keel. I know what my job is. They know what their job is. Everyone's reporting things properly. And then you can start performing. But most agencies um, think they're growing, but they're going forming, storming, forming, storming, forming, storming, forming, storming. And if you can get out of that, then you start like literally growing and the first way you do it is you know where you're going at the end and that um i mean something something we talked about in the pre-show notes was this kind of the idea of um the difference between management and leadership and that painting that vision um and and taking people on that journey that's leadership isn't it it's you know it's very different to kind of management and what are the mistakes you know uh, something you said to me which stuck with me management is learned leadership is earned um can you tell us a bit about that what you mean by that um, so, I mean, typically, almost anyone who has enough um, experience in a role or in a in a um, an industry can be a manager. Um, it, you know, there's obviously nuanced layers to that because of the personal preferences and all sorts of things like that. But um, but almost everyone could learn to be a manager because management is 
um, there's an empathetic layer on top of processes. This is how you deliver de uh, delegation. This is how you manage feedback. This is how you keep things on track. This is how you deal with this. Whereas leadership is a huge amount more um, uh, personal ownership and accountability. Leadership is, uh, is um, uh, uh, there's a lot more consistency required. You need to, um, you need to really um, know who you are before you can lead. Hmm. And most people will never get to that point. And it's not because they're not good people. It's because we just, we're running a million miles an hour. Who has the time to, to decide those quite you know, important things? You can lead people as, a, as an owner of a business. You can lead things, but a leader is someone who genuinely gets followers, who have people follow them because they want to go where that person's going and they want to be where that company or that group of people are going. And that's the difference. And um, you have to earn that because people have to trust you. They have to understand you. You have to understand them. You have to be able to um, very clearly and cogently articulate like where you want to be. And if you if you can't articulate that properly in a way that people who are uh, employed by an, a, a business who choose to have the roles that they do, if you can't articulate the uh, the inter if you can't articulate internally the um, the thing that is meaningful to um, a junior exec who you want to stay in the business for five years, what five years looks like to them, then you can't necessarily expect to lead them that way for five years. Yeah, I mean, so there's that, a big difference. And, and you're right. You you get good at something. So I, well, I was good at public relations, started an agency, and then I've had to learn how to become a leader. We we share books. Yeah. <laughs> you have to learn, but you've said it, it's it's earned, but I do I think you have to learn leadership as well because you can lead sort of at the beginning when everyone's friends and mates and there's only three or four yeah. of you and you can, you can, you sort of, you're learning and you're learning how to manage and how to lead something. But, but when you get to above 15 people and you, you have to, you have to be a leader. Otherwise, like COVID yeah. made a lot of people leaders. I have to say, if you couldn't, you had to lead through that period because those few Lead. days where, you know, we lost 90% of revenue in 24 hours and people were, you know, everybody was pausing. Every, everybody went through it. All, all agency owners, if they're listening to this, will have been through that. And that period really made you earn your leadership, I think. Yeah. And, 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 and there's, a, there's a distinction, I guess, between you as the leader earning it because you've done something hard and the team um uh believing that you've earned it because you've because they've seen that the that the vision is still being realized and that that you are someone they want to follow so um i can earn leadership by being a leader and um, but the people that decide that i'm a leader are the people that follow me and if they don't then i'm not one yet okay so i'm going to check out how many followers you've got now um and if we are following you, <laughs> if you want to follow Chris on Twitter, you, um, I'll, I'll give you a plug for your Twitter. Is it twitter.com slash Chris Simmons? That's right, isn't it? Yes, it, that's it. That's it. All one, all one word. And what's your um, website? Where can people find you? Soon, it? <laughs> so, it's x.com soon, isn't it? It's what? Oh, yeah. God, don't even go there. Then we could do a whole podcast <laughs> um, on that. Um, so if you want to if you want to um, find out a bit more about the OMG Accelerator program, then you can go to omg.center forward slash info center spelt the American way. Um, and then you'll find all the links that you need to take you to where you, where you want to go. Yeah. Thanks for really fascinating chat, Chris. Thanks for coming on the show. Um, and m the best bit about this interview is the Batman sign and the uh, Pac-Man signs behind your head. I think I can't take my eyes off them. Uh, if, if you, is that so just your bedroom it, or is that a studio? No, this is, this is this is the studio in the uh, in the office here. Right, so cool. um, when it, when when you guys you guys asked at the beginning about podcasts and and quality and things like that, one yeah. of the things that that I spent ages doing was YouTube videos on how to get podcast setups right. So I've got uh, Hue lights here, Elgato lights there. I've got all these all this paraphernalia to stop noise bouncing off of hard walls and things like that. So yeah. that's that's all it's there for. Well, these these <laughs> here on the wall, can you see that? That's these are all they're yes. all soundproofers. So yeah, but they're just in our I boardroom because it was quite echoey. Otherwise, it sounds like you're talking in a toilet cubicle or something. Yeah, it, it? it was really rattly when we first <laughs> moved in this building. And do you have an office dog, Chris? Yeah, where is the office dog? I do. I have. I have two. That's that's actually Stephen. Uh, he's going to be nine uh, this month. 
Uh, and we've got Luna, who's his assistant office dog. She's uh, a rescue. Um, she speaks too much, so I can't have her in the room when I record. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. So um, any kind of concluding thoughts before we uh, wrap things up, Chris? Um, I think to to uh, to one of the points that I made and we talked about, if you don't know your numbers and where you're going, know your numbers and know where you're going. Um, if you don't speak to people, speak to agency peers, etc. Speak to advisors, speak to coaches, try and work out where you're going because then you can articulate where you're going to your team. Um, the other part is we talked about um, uh, what all like, other agency leaders are like. Yeah. Um, and when, and how they all behave and is it all pig-headedness and all that sort of stuff. Well, you can find out um, because we're running uh, an event in Manchester on the 19th of October. Um, so if you go to omg.center forward slash IRL, then you'll find all the information out about that. And if you really want to learn about leadership and management, get my book. It's on Amazon, <laughs> nice uh, it's on Kindle, it's on Audible. So, you know, a few plugs there. Um so, um, and, and I've, I'm adding this to the podcast from now on. This is my final question. In your opinion, who should be the next guest on our podcast and what do you think we should ask them? Um, so, I, I think you should have Jerry White on the podcast next. Um, I don't know if you know Jerry White. He's been in the industry since before it was called an industry, I think. Um, he's worked in-house. He's worked in agencies. He's worked for brands. He's worked software companies all in the search and data aspect of, of things. Um, what he doesn't have in terms of perspective on this industry uh, isn't worth having if if, if, uh, if, if that's uh, the case. Nice, all right, thank you for that, okay, nice. Um, okay, great, thanks, nice for, one. Thanks, for that, Chris. thanks for Thanks for that, Chris. No trouble, thank you very much for having me on. So that was a bit different, wasn't it, Chris? Normally, uh, we speak with brands, but actually getting a perspective from agency ownership and agency growth was uh, fascinating. Yeah, the, his take, well, I've listened to two or three of his podcasts with agency owners and so, all very different people. Some people I know on off Twitter, like Daryl, and then some other guys that are, are working in different sectors. And it, it, he has got, ob obviously, dealing with agency owners I always, like I said in, in the interview, I, do, I don't, I know probably eight or nine, and we, you know a few as well. And is there a commonality between them? Are they all, are they all like us? Or <laughs> you don't, you don't, I don't know. Well, I think there's the, the cliched agency owner, isn't there? Who's, you know, we've all watched Mad Men. I think that that informs a lot, but actually different personalities, introverts and extro extroverts. But yeah, undoubtedly, um, it's a fast moving, competitive, creative industry. So you're bound to get certain personality types entering that profession but he, like he said like he sees a lot of arrogance <laughs> I, mean, I was like oh god i hope we don't come across like but he said because of the industry people winning awards you're doing great work and you, you're like actually yeah we can do a great to start a business you've got to think i can do a great i suppose so there has to be a certain type of person but it, that, that that bit was quite interesting i also wanted to really delve onto his fuck-ups but um as as tyler just said to me in the off break there um it felt like a bit of a therapy session for his for his former staff. I mean, we've all made uh, we've all made mistakes running a business, but obviously he's then used that to become a, a mentor and business advisor, which is is quite a different take to have run two or three different agencies mm. and then become a, a coach. That's that that could add real value if you're an agency owner, I suppose, and you you want a coach. Yeah, and a couple of points there. First of all, I think um, the competitive nature of our industry must 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 drive this i mean not every industry you go head to head every pitch with four or five other agencies and you know that's bound to lead to a certain kind of uh, emotional response to how how you behave and the other point um i found interesting which i would say is is, is an issue in the industry when people start agencies they're great at their job they're creative they know how to do the job but it's actually the on the business side of things that perhaps people don't yeah. know leadership HR, finance, and a lot of that you learn on the job, which is crazy when you think about it. You know, you need, and we're big believers in training and skills yeah. and development, aren't we, at Prohibition? You need training. You need to understand the basics and the fundamentals. Yeah, but maybe maybe he's got to a point there, like whether the, the arrogance. So like you and I both go to conferences now and or speak at some, which is fine. You know, you get to invite to speak at some CIPR or whatever. But I go down to, the, like I would go down to the PR Week one to hear what other people have got to say. Because if as soon as you become an agency owner, you need to learn to adapt, innovate, and stay on top of what everybody else is thinking. Because what you're thinking now is not necessarily what everybody's going to be thinking in five years. You've got to stay on top of innovation. And you've got to become, 
dare I say it as a business owner, a bit of a, he's, he's sometimes, some days you've got to be a counselor, uh, you know, helping people through difficult times. There's all sorts of different things you've got, and you have to learn that, like you say, on the job. Re- really, leadership, but leadership courses do help with that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you mentioned kind of chatting with other agency owners. I think it does often end up as a bit of a therapy session. <laughs> yeah. It? And it's you, often you think you're the only person going through this, yeah. um, but actually you speak to other agency owners. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it, it's fairly unique to the agency landscape, isn't it? Like Chris said, you know, it's very, very competitive. It's very, very creative. And that creates a unique set of uh, a unique set of problems in a lot of cases. Well, yeah, yeah, because you, you hear. Well, I went was down at the PR Week conference, and we were. T- I was talking to a couple of the own- owners down there, and they were telling me because obviously we're, we're in Leeds in the north of the UK. We're not in London, but we do serve clients all around the UK. But their take is, oh my god, staff retention in London is a nightmare. Unless you're one of the big five agencies in London, you know, there's there's hundreds, isn't there? And and just keeping staff for more than a year. Uh, recruitment fees to replace those jobs. I was just like, oh my. I said, we, we, we do quite well in Touchwood on terms of that. We've got some great competitors locally in, in Yorkshire that, we, you know, that's that's fine. It's good to have co- competition. But in terms of, you know, we've got quite good retention rates, whereas that's not a massive issue for us. But I did feel sorry for them. So yeah, you're right. It is a bit of a therapy session here in what, you know, because obviously clients just want you to do great work. What campaigns can you do? What you, they don't want to hear about all the agency, oh, staff retention, you know, all, all the things that Chris talked about. What goes on behind the curtain, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. We haven't got any curtains. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. Thank, yeah. So a big thank you to for Chris for coming on the show. Uh, a couple of plugs. Um, we, we have got, um, if you're interested in what we do, um, we have got a 15 minute discovery session that Will always talks about. Um, you can find that um, if you want to book a 15 minute discovery session with us, just go to uh, bit.ly slash socially UA. That's for guests, uh, uh, sorry, listeners and guests of this show. Um, also, if you like what you've heard in these podcasts, we also do webinars, which are longer and obviously face to face live uh, live um, webinars. Our next one's on influencer marketing. Uh, all you have to do is go to prohibitionpr.co.uk. That's prohibitionpr.co.uk and go, click on events and you'll find our list of events. We've got about 10 on demand events and tons coming up, including one on AI, which will be fascinating. Um, so, and, and obviously subscribe to the YouTube channel and keep listening because we, we thank you each and every one of you for, for listening. I hope you found today interesting and we will see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Socially Unacceptable. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and leave us a five-star review. Don't forget to follow us on social media, on Twitter and Instagram at Prohibition PR. We would love to hear some of your career fuck-ups so we can share them on the show. For more information on the show, search Prohibition PR in your search engine and click on podcasts. Until next time, please keep pushing the boundaries and embracing the socially unacceptable.